This is Axis and Allies on the Tour Less channel. Today we are looking at all of them because we can. Before we get going, may I mention that I make these videos in the aid of a charity called Cure Parkinson's. You can guess what they're trying to do. There's a link to them below this video, one in the About section on the channel page. If you haven't had a spare dollar, euro, yen, yak, or British pound, you could send to them. I am sure that they would appreciate it. Now, why are we looking at all the different versions of Access and Allies? There are approximately, depending on how you're going to count them, 16 versions. You get some first print and second print runs, but about 16 versions. Um, and 17 if you include the upcoming North Africa campaign, which I've got on pre-order, and I'll be doing something with that later on. Well, a few months' time yet, but um, it'll be upcoming. And I see this question getting asked onto the various different forums and Facebook pages that I'm part of that says, which version should I buy? And most people answer it wrongly because they're not being asked the correct question um, or given enough information to ask it correctly because you're going you're gonna to tell the person, oh, you must get classic because classic is the original one that's the best or you must get anniversary because that's what I've got. Some will say you must get G40 because it's huge, but you don't know what the person asking the question um, has available to them in terms of their finances, their space, and time available. So if you're asking the question, which is the best first of access and allies for me, let's see if we can help you to ask the right questions of yourself. So let's begin by looking at those three games that are often said to be um, good games to start off with. And I won't argue with that. Um, they're, they're, they're a good starting point for this uh, this video. This is the, the classic edition. Many people will say it's the original and it's the best. Well, they're not quite correct in that. It's not the original. This is the original version of the game made by Larry Harris back in, I think it was 81. Um, it's got some things in there which um, they're a little bit ouch nowadays when you think about them. Um, cardboard counters soon to be placed by plastic counters in, in every other version after that. And um, the map itself, well, it, as you can see, it's got some some really bold colours. Bold as in, oh my God, my eyes are bleeding. Um, the economy is slightly different. The, the turn order is slightly different. The um, turn sequence is different, rather. It does have nukes in there, but... Um, the rules are also not easy to work with, so this is, isn't one I'd recommend you would go with or even purchase, unless you're a bit obsessive like me, then, then pick up a copy. There's about 3,000 of these made. Um, half of them were, were, made, were, were, were published under the Jedco company, um, different cover, but this is the, the original version. When you get onto the classic version, you've got quite a nice um, uh, economy in there in, in terms of the speed of the game and but we'll get more to that later on the other versions that people will recommend to you is the anniversary version a lot of people will tell you this is the one to get and but i won't argue with that um up until a couple of months ago i would have said to you this is probably isn't a good starter version because of its rarity um, but there is a, a, a reprint coming up of this so the prices have come down quite quite a lot now so this actually I would suggest is not too bad a starting place um, there is this which is the second print one of it the first print one has a big 50 down in the corner in, in there to tell you it's the 50th anniversary edition and uh, the third one's going to be um, coming up sometime this year or next year I believe is from Renegade Studios um, there's slightly different uh, rule changes um, but only minor adjustments to the board, the rules, the pieces, they're all pretty similar. But do not confuse the anniversary 1941, as some people do, with the 1941 edition. Some people have seen advertise, advertise this as the anniversary edition. It's not. It's an entirely different game. Um, it has its place within the genre but it's not the same as anniversary. Don't confuse 1941 with spring 41 anniversary. The third one that, uh, as we mentioned before, that um, a lot of people will go for will be the global game. The global game is under here. Here is the global game. And as you can, you can see, well, it is massive. It starts off over there in America land, runs across Europe, all through China, over to the other side of the board, there is America right in the corner over there, and down here in the shine is Australia. 
It is six foot long. It's a big board. It is almost three feet wide, which is just about as much as you can stretch. There is a, a, a bigger version that people will do, but how big do you want to go with it? That's obviously entirely subjective, but you have to understand if you're going for something as big as global, you're gonna need a big table to work on. You do not wanna put it on the floor if you have dogs, cats, children, or even your own size 10 feet to get in the way. Um, you're gonna be making a heck of a mess of this game very quickly unless you get it up and out of the way and, and separate it. Now, I've got other advantages. I've got my, my playroom here where I can put all my stuff in and have a good laugh and leave the thing set up for a long time. Depending upon the aggression of the players, as in how aggressive they are between um, making wars or building up their forces before they go into battle, how keen they are to get on and play this game, um, it could be set up or left set up for two or three weekends, two or three weeks, two or three months even. So you have to understand that if you're going to go for something that is as, as big as this global game, you need somewhere committed to be able to play it, as well as to have the commitment of the players involved as well. Let's now look at the other, other games, but um, in, 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 in groups that I think may be more useful to you than just showing you a whole load of games in their chronological order. So let's get on with what I would describe as the, the group one games, the, the, the one afternoon, one evening, certainly one day games. You can fit these in in a couple of hours, maybe even a couple of games in an in a extended session, depending on a few factors. And, and those factors are, are, are what I've used to give you these groups of, of time taken to play these games. It's going to depend on Primarily, your keenness to play. You might be like me, a bit of a potter. You potter around, make a little move, go and have a cup of tea, come back again. If you're playing solo in that respect, it's going to take a long, long time to play these games. You might not have that time available. It's worthwhile thinking about what time you think you can um, assign to the game. Now, your experience or your group's experience and knowledge of the game will speed things up to a large degree. But also the attitude, as I mentioned before, towards the aggression. If you have belligerent players wanting to bash heads very much, then the game is going to be shorter. When I do my recordings for YouTube, I tend to be more aggressive for those. So um, it's, it's your, your aggression level can change and the, the group of players will change the speed of a the game. There's also a calculation that um, the funny lady and I worked out. Um, but what we found out, um, we, 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 we proved the point mathematically and, and through um, playing the games, is that um, the more money that you have in comparison to the unit costs, um, the slower the game is going to be because um, when you butt heads, you can replace your units much more readily. The third thing to point out to you, and I get a map out, one second. We just quickly use here the, um, the classic board game map. You've got two C zones, one, two, in between the US and the UK, which is one turn's move for most of the ships. One, two, and America are into the UK, um, helping the Allied forces out very readily. Also, in different versions of the game, you will or will not have a starting IC industrial complex factory, for want of a better word, in India. That will make a difference to how the, 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 the Brits themselves are supported and how vulnerable they are from, from the Japanese attacks. So those two things are going to vary the speed of the game as well. So some maps will be faster than other maps. Some IPC um, bases will cause the game to be faster. That's all I'll point out. Let's look at this map at first. So this is the, um, the classic game. It is that big. Um, you could, should be able to play it in a couple of hours. Let's look at some of the components. So some of the other things I'll point out with this game, which you may or may not like. Um, the pieces themselves within the games, they are pretty much generic. Um, whether you've got um, battleships, planes, tanks, armor, in other words, they are all the same sculpt, just in different colors. It may be a problem to you, it's not a problem to me. Um, the other things to point out though, the infantry, are, they are all different, they are all separate sculpts for each of the powers, five powers in this game, and you get some paper money, which is always cool to have, much better than poker chips in my book. The industrial centres are plastic models, which is really good to have, um, but the anti-aircraft ones in different models, some may be um, 
generic like this, or they'll be specific to each of the powers. Different rules will apply within the games, whether you have generic um, anti-aircraft guns, which will be um, this sort of shape, but in white or in grey, or whether you get ones for individual powers. Uh, it's not a big thing, but it may affect your choice of play. The only other things to point out with this version that I think um, the, the rules, when they were written, were um, slightly over-explained in some places, under-explained in others. Um, but it was our first attempt, really, our second attempt, because the first attempt, obviously, was that, um, was that um, Nova version. Um, th there's a little bit in here with, I'm trying to, trying to find it, with um, technology, there we go, technology. Um, you can have tech rolls on this game. You play some IPCs, you roll your dice, and you increase the powers of, of the, um, of the uh, certain units, um, bombers, uh, submarines, jet power, rockets, whatever it is. I find them a little bit overpowered in this game, but obviously you can household it as you like. You can reduce the powers down. You can, you can bring some, some of your own technology ideas into this game. It is quite a, a game which you can um, muck around with and, and, and have your own your own ideas and twists put onto anything in here. And as I said to you, um, with this Nova game, I'm not going to bother going through that. I would not recommend you get that. That's just straight out of the board. Let's look at the other games that are in this Group 1 category. So we have the 1941 edition. This game is what is really a... Um, a stripped down economic version of Axis and Allies. It was built to a price, and I come to that as I show you the uh, components. So this 1941, this base game edition, it was made to a price, as I mentioned, and that does affect the quality of the components that are in here. The um, battle strips here are very thin cardboard in comparison to every other version of the game. And when you come down to the, to the round doors, the, the control markers that you put on, again, it's thin cardboard. It's much thinner than the rest of the games. But one of the worst things about it is that when you have your chip stacks, rather than putting on, say, one infantry, one tank, you put up a stack of chips. In every other edition of the game, they are plastic components that lock in together. In this version, they are cardboard chips, which slide around all over the place and will not lock in. Um, and it's very thin, cheap cardboard. I'm not knocking the game for the economy um, wise of it because um, it's too easy to do that, but it's built to a price as an introductory game. And it's also built, I think, for me to buy this game, nick the components out of it because the, some of the sculpts that are in this game are different to sculpts in the other game. And little magpies like me, we want to just buy this game and use the components elsewhere. Um, I have played this board. I do like playing this actual map itself because it's a very fast game. You've, you've got um, three spaces between the UK and the US. You do have a factory in, in India, and the economy of this game means that as soon as something's got, got bashed, you have a big job of replacing anything expensive, bombers, battleships, etc. They're hard to replace. Um, also, with this game, setup cards are on the back of the book, which means you have to pass the book around to everybody when you want to set the game up. But that's not too much, because there's only a, a very small setup for most of the powers in here anyway. But... Um, as a fast introductory game to see whether you like this game or not, then certainly pick up 1941. And as you move on and your game develops, you want to buy another game, you've got these components you can ship into other places. Let's look at one of the much maligned games of this series. This to me is unfairly maligned. Axis and Allies and Zombies. We get told by the people that dislike it that it's not real. Didn't have zombies in World War II. Yeah, okay. Didn't have dice rolls in World War II. Well, I don't like that. But um, that's just uh, me fighting back. I think Zombies is a great, fun game. Again, the economy keeps the game tight, keeps the game short. Um, you've got an odd an odd battle order or, or combat sequence in this. So it gets, it gets um, put down on a slightly enlarged battle board. You are lacking with this game in um, cruisers. I think in uh, 1941 you don't get um, cruisers but you do get artillery, it could be the other way around. Um, but on these smaller faster games you would get fewer components overall and a, le a less variety of components. 
meaning it's a less complex game to play. But with the zombie game, you do get proper setup cards. They're nice and thick and chunky, and instructions on the back really to help out each of the players to tell them what they how how you can move, attack, defend, etc. It's a good sort of introductory game to to bring people into this into this genre because people that don't necessarily like war games. Well, they may still yet like zombie games. Zombie games are always going to be fun, in my book. Um, and then when it comes to the um, to the sculpts themselves, all the powers of these sculpts are all different. So you've got a nice variety, much more modern in its feel. Plus, you do get thirty odd zombies to put on the board to start bashing your infantry artillery and having a good zombie bite out of them. There are also special zombie dice in this edition. Um, to, to control the zombies and to, to kill the zombies with zombie hits in certain ways. And you get specially blooded zombie paper money, which is just cool in my book. <laughs> to control the game, to control the zombies, you get a pack of zombie cards. They are going to tell you where to put zombies and how they appear with extra bonuses down on the bottom of the cards. But along with that, you get a second set of cards where you can transform or transfer this game all the way over to Access and Allies 1942 Second Edition. These cards will control that particular board, so you can use the zombie game, the zombie idea, zombie rules, in a different version of the game. A nice little extra added touch to it. The um, downside is that on this board itself, they have spelling errors. In the rule book, they have spelling errors. And in these, those zombie cards, they have spelling errors. Somebody, somebody didn't have their spell checker working. It's a very poor show on what is otherwise, as I keep saying, a fun game. But the only thing to remember with these four games is they're not supposed to be a big, massive, brain-burning thinking game, especially with zombies. It's just a bit of a laugh. Um, throw some dice around, have some fun, have some beer. 1941, the one that's just below this, I would suggest is similar um, because of the, the um, less complexity that's involved in it. Have a laugh, throw some dice around and um, think about whether you move on to other versions of the game from here, which is what we're about to do right now. So whilst we are moving up in time now, these, this next three games are more of a very long evening or a couple of days, maybe a, a weekend to play them. Um, but we have gone back a couple of years in, 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 in the timeline because these came out in the early 2000s, whereas Zombies and 41 came out in, in the, the, the later 2010s-ish. Don't quote me on that. This is what's known as the revised edition. It's a very good edition. Let's have a look inside at all these bits and pieces. Okay, this is the revised edition. It's a bit of a love it or hate it board. Personally, I love this board. I love the dark colours. It floats my boat. Um, it's one of those ones with quite a fast move from the America land. You go from one, two sea zones. That's one move of your navy. And you're into the UK to help support them in their battle against the, um, against the um, Axis forces. The setup charts themselves... They are hard to read for me. That, that colour scheme, yep, yeah, I really do struggle with that, I must admit. Um, but when we look down here on the setup charts and we see industrial complex, we don't get one in India down here. It does mean that the Brits have to resupply India from quite a long way off if they can. But I've found in this version that Japan do not have an um, easy time getting in. Yeah, they have a bit of a more of a problem from the Soviets. It's just the way the setup's gone or the way I've played it because everyone's going to be playing this game differently. You may or may not disagree with me, but in terms of the colour of this board, absolutely love it. You do get proper plastic chips and all the versions on from that um, 1941 edition. You will get plastic industrial centres and these generic anti-aircraft guns. These will affect the rules of how um, Bombers and fighters are shot down over areas or when they pass over areas that will vary from game to game. Um, one of the best things about this game is its um, hidden gems at the back in appendix number two or three. Appendix, appendix three. What we have here is national advantages. 
each power, and there's five powers in this game, have some advantages. And you can decide to mix them, match them, you can randomly assign them, you can um, choose them yourselves, or you can play without these national advantages. These are real game changes, but not in the overpowered way that I believe they are in that classic edition, that big blue box edition. These are very, very well thought out and will give just enough of a, of a twist to the game to keep you playing it many, many times and never have the same game twice. The other big bonus with this is because so many people dislike this colour of the board, you can actually pick this up at a very reasonable price on the second hand market. It's, this is one of my top tips, one of my, um, my go-to games. And you're probably going to hear me say go-to games several times in this because I've always got a game set up on the go. Um, apart from right now, when I've got them all taken down to, to, to um, compile this video for you. But I am playing um, Santa Cruz over there in the background. Kind of a bit I'm addicted to games. So at about the same time that they bought out the Advanced Edition, they also bought out Access and Allies Pacific and Europe. Do not confuse these with Access and Allies Pacific 1940 and um, Europe 1940. They are different games, but these two um, are again, well, this particular one, Pacific, and another one of my go to games. I'm going to say it a lot. I'll tell you what, I'm going to say it a lot. Let me show you for why. So, we begin with the Pacific board. It is absolutely wonderful colours in my book, absolutely floats my boat. It was a bit of a game changer in terms of what they were going to get you to try to do when we started playing this Pacific game. Because you do have uh, um, air bases and naval bases that have um, adjusted rules in there which have been brought forward into other versions of the game with the amount of movement allowance that you get and a kind of a scramble rule in, in the Pacific. They call it combat air patrols, which means you can put units out into the oceans to protect your units or protect your areas from units coming into it by the enemies. You also have the introduction of convoy zones and convoy centres in this version. Um, an island needs to be supplied by a convoy and you can get units into there to protect it or to, um, to stymie the opposition's money. Also, with this version, it's a victory points based game rather than a possession game, although possession is going to give you victory points. But you are trying to earn points for Japan to win this game in a number of turns. The other thing that we get into this one is a set of units that are unusual, haven't been seen before, and I don't think they've been seen properly since then. You have your normal American infantry within this game, dropping them on the floor, but you also have some American Marines. American Marines can, as Marines would do, attack the islands from the sea, giving them bigger combat values than you would normally get from just infantry. It's a novel idea, it's, it's particular to this particular game, and, and, and hasn't been seen since as far as I can remember. Also with this game, we're getting an introduction of some, some dedicated ch Chinese troops to work in this area of the board. Again, that doesn't come into other, other versions until much later on. You're going to get your plastic ICs and anti-aircraft guns in my little baggies. And we also have paper money, can't be paper money, marshalling cards and fleet trays. You put your roundel for that country on this particular piece, you put the fleet tray into an ocean and you put these off board somewhere else so as you can move your fleets around rather than moving several units around. I prefer not to use these. I like my boards nice and busy and full of um, infantry, artillery, tanks and planes. Other than that, we are yet to get um, cruisers coming into this game. We still only get aircraft carriers, destroyers, submarines and battleships, which might be over the page one way or t'other. Um, cruisers start coming into later versions of this game. It doesn't matter that you don't get cruisers in this game, but you are getting artillery, infantry and tanks, which is plenty enough for variance and, and complexity to keep you um, entertained and, and thinking very hard. 
The other brilliant thing about this game is that it's a very good game for introducing new players to. Um, though you have the, the, the slight differences of convoy zones and convoy areas and the, the victory point bits and pieces, if you let the newbie player players Japan, Japan get a first turn, first strike, where the Allied forces over in the Pacific, not in China itself, everywhere else, defend on a roll of one rather than the higher values. It makes the newbie player, when playing as Japan, feel like they are some kind of god of war games because they get that, that instant um, advantage over the opposition, which is a great idea for, for bringing people in and making them feel involved in the action. There's no shilly shallying around of long build-ups as you may get in some of the bigger versions of the game. You're into the action and if you're playing as Japan, you are, you are ahead of the game on turn one 90% of the time. The sibling game to Pacific, obviously, will be the Europe version. Now, as you can see, it is an entirely different colour scheme to Pacific. These do not go together and form a global game, although there are house rules and, and rules people have worked out that will mash them together as a global game. I've tried them, it was a bit clunky for my liking, but you, know, you might be of a, a different, different idea. And the colour scheme for this, mm, yeah, it's a it's a bit funky. With this, this um, Europe version, similar components as to Pacific. Don't need to go through that. Plenty enough units to play the game with. Again, you don't get, you're not getting cruises. It's, a, it's of that era, of that ilk. Um, because of this massive economy, battleships here costing 24 and bombers on 15, it's going to be one of those games where replacements are hard to come by. With the convoy system in here, though, they are much more obvious and much more easy to manage by either of the players. It's much more visual, should we say. You've got British, American and Soviet convoy zones, which you're trying to protect or, as a German player, trying to get into to try to disrupt the Brits. It's a, it's a different way of play, playing the game. It's not the same as the uh, Pacific that's below it, where you have victory points. It's still a possession type of game. But also down here in the Middle East, you have um, oil fields, which again is going to affect, it's actually in, in, in the camera, down there, that's going to affect the economies of, of, of the, um, the German player quite dramatically, if they can get hold of those. Um, it gives you a different focus, different way of playing the game. I quite like playing this version of the game, but I do prefer Pacific. Um, but I wouldn't suggest that you'd buy one over the other myself. I, I think they're both cracking versions of the game and uh, quite readily available on that second-hand market. Again, it's, it's, it's that paper money and um, industrial complexes and generic anti-aircraft gun rules that we know about thus far. That is going to be the end of the, um, the, um, the two-evening type of games, the, the, the long evening or two-evening two weekend games. Let's look at something a little bit more complex, a little bit more maybe interesting. Okay, so we have Spring 1942 First Edition and Spring 42 Second Edition. Now, when I say these are more interesting, I'm not trying to be derogatory about the previous games. I just mean the amount of um, thought you must put into your moves in the games from now onwards are slightly more involved in depth because you're getting more units involved in the games you're getting infantry artillery tanks bombers fighters cruisers destroyers submarines battleships anti-aircraft uh, guns um, aircraft carriers the whole works the whole gambit comes into these games from now on in let's look at 1942 first edition first there are differences between the first and second editions. They're not massively different that you should buy one to, to over t'other, but um, I would suggest you, you, you do think about which one you would prefer to pick up. You can still purchase the um, 42 second edition um, brand new. So when we're looking at the uh, first edition board, as you can see, you've got this national production chart right down in front. That to me is really annoying because I'm always knocking the counters off out of the place here. Um, you have to use a little bit of blue tack below your counters, keep things in place. Also with this version, you have one turn's move to get from America to the UK. That again is gonna make this game slightly faster. The first edition, compared to the second edition. Um, it is an important thing to, to point out to you. 
you will get your um, plastic industrial centers in here and your generic anti-aircraft guns whereas in the second edition of the game the board is slightly bigger um, makes it a bit more convenient for moving your units around for seeing what you're doing it just feels like a whole a whole bigger game it's not much bigger but it is bigger in terms of the time and the um, complexity of it when you get to the second edition you are blessed with the 410 pieces it's 40 more um, your tracker is up here on top of the board much more convenient in in my book and you do have one two three seasons to get across to the uk um, which makes that game slightly slower than than the 42 first edition you also will have a base here in india and uh, an industrial center here in india that you can start producing units on the coal face keeps india a little bit more defendable but with the Japanese attacking it very early, it does become quite vulnerable. A lot of people will suggest that this game is Axis biased, and so is, they may play with a bidding system where the um, the uh, allied players will take 10, 15, 9 PCs uh, bonus at the start of the game. Um, yep, I much prefer to use the Larry Harris tournament rules for this game, where you add infantry to India, you move some submarines from the Atlantic, and you move one of the German bombers away into the Ukraine as well. That balances the game up absolutely beautifully in my book. One of the um, slightly um, downsides of this game, in my opinion, other people would say it's an advantage, is that we now go away from having those plastic industrial centers and we start using cardboard tokens. Some people like them, some people hate them. I much prefer old school that's just me um, but it does mean that the footprint for these industrial centers are smaller than the the big plastic ones it gives you more of them on the board um, with the 42 however second edition the um the chips that you use are different to every other version of the game as you can see these are the first edition chips and they are the same size chips that most other versions will have these ones are slightly smaller, slightly thicker, have a different serration. So the ones from the 42 second edition, you can't use with any other edition. Um, if you love several editions, you're probably gonna be using these all the time and just putting those to one side. I actually use these as spares in my 1914 edition. Don't worry about that, we'll come to that later on. We also move away from the generic scobs for anti-aircraft guns in the 42 second edition each power gets their own set, uh, special scopes for their anti-aircraft guns. Different rules will now apply for how the aircraft guns are used and their placement, their capture, movement, etc. But it, it doesn't mean that one game is better than the other for the scopes, for the pieces. Um, I think these are both very enjoyable games. Um, and again, it's, it's going to be a, a, a two-day game, maybe a two-and-a-half-day game, depending on, obviously, I said to you about how aggressive you are and how, uh, how au fait you are with the rules and your own ideas of tactics. Let's now look at um, the anniversary game. So this is one of my go-to games. As I said to you, the Pacific is a go-to game. Yeah, I, I go to them all. Of the, um, those two 1942s, first and second edition, I tend to play the second edition more than the first edition. That's just my own preference. But as you can see, box size, I haven't moved the camera at all. The um, anniversary box is gi huge in comparison to everything else. So you're gonna to have to have, think about where you put that. Um, under the sofa to get eaten by the dogs? No, 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 no. Put it in a bank vault in Switzerland. Keep it safe, keep it secure. Let's look at the bits that are inside it. 600 components. That's bigger than most others. It's not until you get to the um, Europe 1940 and Pacific 1940, you start getting this number of pieces in the game. So just as the box is that much bigger than the other editions, so is the board. It is not as huge as the um, G40 board, which stretches right across to the end of the table over there. So I'd suggest that where the um, G40 is six foot long, this is maybe a four foot long board. It is probably an absolute ideal size. It will fit onto a large kitchen table, your dining table, um, and you will have a wonderful, wonderful time playing the Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition. 
Let's have a look at one more piece to show you which you might be interested in. Storage boxes. Now storage boxes are absolutely fantastic compared to having plastic baggies to put all your stuff in. Even the, um, the trays which uh, most of the components are kept in in other versions are a bit inconvenient for when you're trying to move them around. They spill all over the place. These boxes keep everything in place and they make a pretty picture as well. This is how I approach my storage solution, um, not using the boxes from, from, the, um, from the anniversary, but boxes here are from the 1940 Europe and Pacific versions. Um, these are the boxes, some cardboard dividing trays to put bits and pieces in, keeps things really handy, really gettable. And using these thin filing cabinets, um, you can take these drawers out and change the turn order as turn orders change on different games as well. Um, yeah, it, it helps me out. It's funky, it's easy, it's quick. Um, and I think I picked this up, this whole unit up second hand for about 15, 20 pounds, something like that. It's not expensive, but it's a really good solution. So the things worth pointing out to that you get within this game is some Chinese troops, which are operated by the Americans. Again, we've gone back slightly to the um, plastic industrial centers, although they're an advantage to me, and generic anti-aircraft guns. You're going to love it or hate it and you get some special anniversary ipcs or money to go with the game i, I quite like those um, you also will get you also will get some um markers to tell you about um victory cities that um that have been gained or lost by other by other powers and it's victory cities which are going to win you the game in most versions of this game and they got some some tech markers now the tech in this game yeah, I, I I quite like playing with tech rules for mixing the game up a little bit. But again, with this one, you have to pay some money to roll some dice and then you get a dice roll to randomly get the um, the choice of, of tech. I much prefer being able to focus on the tech. Why wouldn't a power be thinking about which tech they actually want rather than something happening by pure chance. But again, you could household anything you like in this game. And in the anniversary edition, we now have Italian troops coming into the, to the series. There's also two setups. There's a 1941 setup and a 1942 setup. Meaning, if you want a slightly longer game, you set up the 41 because it starts earlier. There's fewer pieces on the board. The economy has a different balance to it. 1942 it's going to be a faster game because the game has already developed slightly there's slight map differences slight rule differences between the first edition and the second edition of this and i believe the third edition will have a slightly adjusted board as well but um not so much that having one game rather than the other is absolutely essential the other thing to the last thing to show you actually with this game i'll do it sort of half and half is i've got for well, many games, but including this one, some folded up foam. <laughs> when you find some bob bits of foam, keep hold of them, put them in your box. When you put your lid back on your boxes, as they do, if you happen to put a box on top of that, you won't be crushing the boxes and making all those horrible corner creases which occur sometimes. I think in the uh, classic game, I've got an old egg carton in there, which is jacks the whole thing. There's so much room in it. But that's, that's just a, a good idea in, in my book. But certainly with this um, anniversary edition, it's one of those ones that's going to take you, I would suggest, two, maybe three evenings to play, a long weekend. Um, I definitely would dedicate plenty of time towards it. And people that, um, that recommend this game, they're not wrong. It, it, it's a really good version to have. Yes, it's one of my my go-to versions. So let's move on to the Goliaths, as I would like to call them. I think 1914 is a Goliath of a game. Let me show you for why. The board itself isn't too big, but it is very big. It is larger in terms of the um, depth going across there than the other games that we played. But it isn't quite as long as that anniversary edition. And it's not my camera gone wonky. It is counted over at a slightly odd angle. Goes right from up there and across to there. It's, it's not too huge, but it is a larger footprint in terms of depth. 
it will fit on the kitchen table you just got to be able to move all around the board itself and um, the colors won't be different these tastes i quite like them and the components for the um, 1914 game um, reflect the, the difference in the way the game is played. Um, you do not move your units onto the battle board, you move the dice onto the battle board. Therefore, you get loads of these little funky 6mm dice as well, which we quite like. And the, the chips themselves, you have blue and red chips, which and I've got some grey ones from my 1942 edition. Um, but you use your chips as per your powers. So all your central powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottomans will be using one color of chips, and the Entente, the Brits, the Americans, the French, etc., uh, Italians, will be using the other colors of chips. So it helps you to, to um, see the difference between the eight powers that are involved in this game. You can very quickly see who's doing what, when, where, and why. Uh, the only downside from this first edition of the 1914 and it's been a regular complaint about it is there weren't enough units in the initial setup um, to be able to buy more infantry for germany but i got around that very easily rather than complaining i got some units which are of a similar color and stuck them into the game job done sorted however renegade on their um, reprint of this game have added more units into the setup so that problem has disappeared for you um, and more chips into the box as well for chipping units up with so again it's they, they've made the game better in terms of the number of units involved they have also as I understand it made this board slightly larger and they've changed the dimensions of the central European states to give you more room in here for putting your units on because believe me it's like trench warfare because it's world war one you get a battle in here that gets stuck for turn after turn after turn and you have got enough units to enough space to move units into having more space there was a really good idea by renegade i applaud them for that this game itself yep you heard it it's one of my go-to games i get um itchy fingers if i haven't played this game for two or three weeks i want to get it set up again and have another bash some people think that the central powers have a really tough time of it that's the ottoman germany and um austria hungary coalition which which goes against the allies or the entente um and yes it is hard for them to, to get over it but if you get it even close to a victory um with with the um the weaker side and that feels like a win to me i have never complain about having a good battle on, on on a losing side but as long as you're enjoying the, the fun and being challenged in many different ways there are some slight balancing rules that larry harris has brought in with his tournament rules it introduces economic and political collapse that does balance the game slightly and I, I quite enjoy playing with those ones but as i said to you this game i will play this to my heart's content i really enjoy playing this game i really enjoy the trench warfare aspect of it when you've got a huge stack of people you've got one dice roll and you're hoping for the best and you can get some monumental legendary moments happening in there either good or legendary bad or you are just stuck with an absolute headache but units themselves aren't necessarily stuck where they're positioned. If you've got a whole lump of people, you can move people up and down the lines. You can reinforce areas. You can move units out into other areas you also own. So you're not quite just moving, we're stuck, moving, you're stuck. But you have to keep your, your, your wits about you. Um, you leave a hole somewhere and the, um, the opposing side will come flooding through in this game. And uh, it's a tidal wave. You can't stop. Okay, the big cheese is now. We have the Europe 1940 second edition in this case and Pacific 1940 second edition. These aren't the same as those first Europe and Pacific as I mentioned before, but they are very similar to Pacific or Europe 1940 first edition. It won't have anything written there, just say Pacific 1940. Very similar. Smaller, I think maybe there's a, a, a rata corrections in the book. And maybe it's a sculpt or two difference, but they're basically going to be the same game. Have no worries about whether you have first or second edition. As long as I would suggest playing them in pairs in case I'm wrong with reading all those rules again, which I'm not going to do. Put these two together, you have got the massive global game, which is under this cloth. You've seen this before. Um, you have 
500 plus pieces in Pacific, 600 plus pieces in Europe. You've got everything in here. You have got infantry, artillery, tanks, bombers, fighters, mechanized infantry, which came into this game, which moves your infantry along at a slightly faster rate. They can blitz in with tanks and so on and so forth. You have got your battleships, your cruisers, your aircraft carriers, submarines, transport, the whole, this is the real deal. I'd heartily recommend both of these games. If you're gonna buy them, I would suggest buying Europe first and having Pacific as the add-on, even though they came out in the reverse order, I think the Pacific came out first. I believe that you get a better game from Europe than you do from Pacific and a, a learning game as well. It's not too big to have this as a solo game to play for a, for a one weekend. But when you go for the global, it's gonna be set up for, well, yeah, a, a good week in my book. Um, other people will take shorter times. I take tend to take longer when I'm playing the global game, two or three weeks set up, and I absolutely love every single minute of it. It introduces the um, concept of tactical bombing into this as well, because you've got Navy bases and air bases along with minor and major industrial complexes. The tactical bombers can hit various bits and parts of it. The strategic bombers can hit various different parts of it. The counters for those though, the um, air, navy and industrial complexes are back to that cardboard version from the 1942 second edition. Again, not my favorite, but I've got other sculpts I can use that. I've got plenty of other games which I steal pieces from and in include into it. Um, you've also got the inclusion of the, the full range of sea units, battleships, aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers, transport, submarines, the whole works in that. Don't worry about that. But also with this, you've got this idea of um, national objectives um, coming. They, they came from the um, anniversary. Did I mention the anniversary? You've got national objectives in anniversary and in this one where you can um, hit certain areas with um with with targets they're going to give you extra ipc bonuses for holding one or two or several regions as per what would be really good for each power and obviously other powers will try to disrupt that but as i say it, it, it does make this into one one heck of a game it really is the you know, the real deal so we'll finish up with a quick look at these um campaign games all the rest of those games got um, longer and longer in time taken to, for you to play them. These games should all be played in one evening time, easily within one evening time. No problem at all with that. D-Day, one of my favourites, not as complex as uh, Battle of the Bulge coming up, not as challenging, interesting as Battle of the Bulge, I would suggest, but I play this game as my campaign game more than the other two that um, is currently out here. With the... Um, D-Day game, it comes on one big board, it's upside down, it comes out of the box, it comes on one big board, covering the Normandy landings. You've got the uh, Americans fly in here, Canadians come down here, although it's represented only by the Brits in this version of the game, and there are three victory cities that you are trying to grab hold of, or the Germans are trying to stop you from getting hold of. Um, you, it's all done in 10 rounds. It is not quite what would be known as a card draw game, but cards do control the progress of the game. There are three sets of cards in here. You have your order cards. You must use your order cards. You turn them over one at a time, and it takes you through the progress of a round. You also have fortune cards. As you might know, they're gonna change the fortune, good or bad, for either side. And you will have tactic cards if you want to start using a bit more thought integrity whatever it is you must play with orders you can play with either or both of those cards in the sets i tend to put all the cards in there and play with all three packs of cards when i play this game it's a very good game it's a very fun game it's a very fast game but the rules themselves for all these campaign games are slightly different to the um the rules in the global or the theater games and it does um take a little bit of getting used to, a little bit of understanding that a lot of these are single dice roll affairs um, rather than the, the multiple dice roll affairs in on all other versions apart from 1914. But I think this to me would be my recommendation as a campaign game. Um, would it definitely be better than Battle of the Bulge? That's going to be up to you to decide. 
but I quite like the, the fun factor in D-Day, almost as fun as maybe the Zombies game. When we look at Battle of the Bulge, which I've only just finished playing this game actually, this is uh, my, my weekend's fun. Um, you do get one very large, I'm going to open up, one very large, one very grey board. You either love it or hate it. I quite like it. Um, the markings on here aid the setup where you put your supplies, infantry, artillery, etc. Germans trying to come through here, push the bulge, allies are trying to keep them back. Certain areas you can't go through, etc. It is a victory points game. Germany trying to get to 24 victory points inside, on this side, eight rounds. You will get planes come into it. The plane rules, the aircraft rules, mm, a little bit chunky when you first when you first read them, but they, they soon they soon lock into place. And again, it's a game that you can play inside one evening time. Um, you could even probably get two games of this in, in one evening if you're particularly quick and au fait with the rules. Um, it is, again, it's a one dice roll affair. But in this version, different to every other version of the game, you have really groovy, 12-sided dice. I like 12-sided dice, they roll really nicely. The only unusual thing about this is um, you have plenty of pieces in here. Enough infantry, artillery, tanks, planes, bombers, etc. for all the powers, including far too many anti-aircraft guns for Germany. I do not know why there's so many of those in here, but they just have. But on the setup cards, you are two infantry short. That's all it is. It just means you have to take some off the board and put them back on the setup charts later on. I don't know why they did that. It, it seems an odd thing to me, but you know, packet sizes, whatever else it is. But you are always two infantry short when you set the game up. And on the setup cards themselves, and the um, player aids that come with the um, Battle of the Bold Edition, they are quite thin, quite papery. Laminate them. Definitely laminate them. Keep them stiff. Keep them in pristine condition. This game becomes usable again and again and again, and I play this again and again and again. It's one of my, you got it, go-to games. Let's uh, have a look at the third game in the system, Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal is the third and, up till now, final game of the campaign series. They produced fewer of these than the, than the other versions. I think the popularity went down for um, campaign games. don't know why, I quite enjoy playing campaign games. Um, but that's just the way it is. This itself, though, um, it has different challenges. It is the one that I've played the least, and I think I, it's not the go-to game um, of the campaign series. It's a very good version of the game. It's more of a two-player game than anything else. You have um, air bases which you're trying to capture or build, um, and it's much more prescribed in terms of... Um, your setups and your, your, your units that are available to you. But you have supply tokens that you can buy units with and, and fix your damaged units with. You both sides, uh, Axis and Allied, or America and Japan, are trying to build up their victory point totals and it will, it will continue like a um, tumbling dice. You will always be increasing your numbers just about every single turn. So you should be able to play one or even two games of this in one evening time. The only, um, I would suggest, downside with this system um, is the battle box itself. This is where you put your dice in, you roll your dice, you pull your sleeve out, and it tells you what you may or may not have hit. Um, it's... It, it gets damaged very quickly, this dice, this box. I don't know why they continue with it. I've customised mine. I might do a video about that later on. Um, but you do have um, some different technologies which are in this game, which can um, really make your choices and the way you play the game very variable. And I quite like the, um, the technology in this game, uh, or, or to use technology in this game, more than I would do it in other games, I think. Um, but that just helps to keep this game fresh, because otherwise... Um, where it's one of the shorter campaign games, you can end up doing the same things um, more often than not. So I suggest if you've got Guadalupe now, if you can afford it, then certainly pick it up. But it, but but look at the um, the um, technologies more more readily than you would do perhaps in other games. And they are printing Guadalupe Canal again. So um, whilst there are some extraordinary prices who have been asked for Guadalupe Canal over the years, 
it's now coming down in price to something much more reasonable. Now there is a fourth campaign game, even though I said by the canal was the last one. This fourth campaign game isn't out yet. Here's a photocopy that I've got off of the interweb. Um, North Africa, mine is already on order. Um, I do not know how the game's going to play out. I believe it should be played in one evening time, maybe a second evening time. But there are convoy systems in there, similar to the old Pacific and Europe games, and obviously convoys that happen in the, um, the big global games, etc. There are supply tokens, like we have in the Battle of the Bulge. There are stack limits which happen in Battle of the Bulge and something called flanking. Now I don't know what it's actually going to be, but I believe that if you are attacking from two different areas, you are going to get some combat bonuses. Similar to the old Hex and Counter games where you are where you are flanking the units around and more about positioning rather than just lumping all units into one place. Um, there's also land mines and sea mines in this North Africa, apparently, which you had um, sea mines in 1914. Um, and various different households have put land mines and sea mines in areas. So another good idea. It will work on a 10 sided dice system. And there are apparently two scenarios, an eight uh, turn scenario and a 14 turn scenario, if I remember rightly from the video that I saw. So again, you're going to have a, a longer or shorter game um, depending on your own preferences. I'm very much looking forward to, to North Africa when it comes out sometime later on in 2024. Okay, that, um, that timeline of, um, in terms of not chronology, but how long the games were taking each time, um, was not just plucked out of thin air. There's been experience of playing all those games over a number of years. And myself and the funny lady, we sat down and we worked out a value, as I mentioned in the middle of that video, for the starting IPCs of certain powers within each version of the game and the, um, the, the value of certain units, because it, it does vary from, from, from version to version. But the less money you have available, the faster the game is going to be played. 1941 and Zombies are very fast games because there's few IPCs around. And when you get into battle, units clash, some are lost. You can't afford to replace them. The game is over faster. Doesn't make it a better game. Doesn't make it a worse game. It just is, is how long it's going to take you to play the game. I do realise that I haven't answered anybody's questions here. It's an impossible question to answer because, as I said at the start of this game, um, start of this video, that um, your finances are different to my finances. The availability of time that you have and space that you have and the availability of the games in your areas. I mean, I shipped a couple of games across to a guy over in Norway um, because he couldn't get hold of the versions in his, in his country. Um, not that I'm a, a dealer right now, I just have to have a spare versions. So um, I, I help the, the, the guy out there. And, 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 and prices, I think, say of um, Battle of the Bulge in the UK are entirely different to the prices of Battle of the Bulge over in America land because of the availability of the games. People have got them and keep hold of them, or they got them and got rid of them, whichever way around it's going to be. So um, I, I, I think that um, all I can do is try to suggest how long games should take and, and how much space should take up. It's only the global that's going to be an absolute nightmare for you in terms of space if you haven't got a, a dedicated playroom like I have. And perhaps 1914 is quite a large board is as well, both in, in terms of width and depth. Um, but other than that, most of those games should fit onto a kitchen table, large kitchen table, your dining table, and, and take as I said, you're increasing amounts of time from, from one evening to a long evening to a long weekend to, and that's my global is set up. I have that set up for three or four weeks and, and love every minute of it. So um, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions that you want to ask me, stick them down in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them as um, sympathetically and unbiased as I can, because I'm not getting paid any money by Renegade or any of the studios to, to make these videos. I just hope that um, I can enthuse other people with the um, with the enthuse with the enthusiasm that I have, because I'm enthusiastic like a five year old on um, on tokaises. Till next time, be cool.